At the end of March, President Biden released his annual budget proposal, which included an increase of $31 billion in defense spending. That amount puts next year's Pentagon budget at $813 billion, which means that the U.S. will spend more on its military than the next 11 countries combined, and also that Biden has requested more defense spending than any president, including Republicans, since World War II. This is, to put it bluntly, a nauseating amount of money to sink into defense. For context, the annual defense budget is now more than double what the country spends on all anti-poverty safety net programs combined minus Social Security. That includes food stamps, housing assistance, and disability benefits, among other programs. Biden's proposed Pentagon budget would also exceed what the government spends on subsidizing health care each year by more than $100 billion. So especially when you consider that Republicans and Democrats alike perpetually wring their hands over the cost of things like Build Back Better, the expanded child tax credit, student debt relief, and even infrastructure, it's clear that our legislators are making some very calculated decisions when they decide to pour this much money into the Pentagon. The trade-off a given nation makes between military spending and social spending is, of course, often shorthanded as guns or butter. I think it's worth revisiting this concept not only because of Biden's latest budget proposal, but also because over the last two years, the idea of guns or butter on the city level has caught on via activists' calls to defund the police. Now, the call to take money out of police budgets and reallocate it to things like schools, libraries, housing, and other public services is in many ways very similar to asking why our government spends more on wars than it does on education. After all, there's something pretty grotesque about the NYPD flying around military-grade spy helicopters that cost $10 million apiece at the same time that so much of the city's public housing and public schools continue to suffer from lead contamination and the public transit system steadily deteriorates. But as Catalyst contributors John Clegg and Adonar Usmani, among others, have pointed out, one problem with trying to reallocate money on the city level is that municipal police budgets are actually too small to cover the cost of funding a comprehensive social safety net. For instance, the NYPD budget, which is the largest in the country, has hovered around $6 billion for years. But consider that the New York City Department of Education budget was $38 billion between 2021 and 2022. Likewise, the Vera Institute has estimated that the total cost of policing in the U.S. comes out to around $115 billion per year. As one contributor to Damage Magazine wrote, that may seem like a lot, but as a point of comparison, the cost of all K-12 education in the U.S. is around $640 billion, and the Medicare budget alone is $638 billion. So, in other words, even if over-policing seems like a waste of money, it's actually sadly way cheaper than building a robust welfare state. And in fact, in the U.S., this is by design. Clegg and Usmani argue that starting in the 1960s, America's approach to reducing crime defaulted to beefing up law enforcement and prisons rather than investing in public goods and services that could ameliorate poverty and unemployment, aka the root causes of crime. Why did the U.S. take this approach? As the authors write, waging an all-out war on the root causes of crime is equivalent to the task of building a large redistributive welfare state that takes from the rich to give to the poor. And by the end of the 1960s, with organized labor and the civil rights movement entering their decline, there were very few, if any, institutions or movement in the country that were capable of forcing this kind of redistribution. What's more is that during the same time period, the U.S. was fighting a costly war in Vietnam, and to keep the Pentagon coffers full, the Johnson administration authorized cuts to a number of domestic Great Society programs. So on a national level, guns won out over butter, or as Clegg and Usmani put it, imperialism abroad killed reform at home. As a result, today the ratio of social to punitive spending in the U.S. is far smaller than that of other advanced capitalist countries, which means that the reason the U.S. leans so heavily on over-policing and mass incarceration to deal with crime is because when it comes to domestic policy, the U.S. government is cheap as hell. Denmark, for instance, spends 40 times more on social services than it does on prisons, police, and courts. So if we're serious about creating the type of society that can reduce policing and simultaneously address the root causes of crime through the expansion of public goods, we're simply going to need more money than even the richest police departments in the U.S. can deliver. 
Which is to say that we should look at the money that goes into our bloated war machine as something that actually can begin underwriting the construction of a functioning welfare state in the US. The guns or butter trade-off, so to speak, can really only happen on a meaningful scale at the federal level. This is because the federal government alone has the kinds of funds and leverage necessary to implement universal public goods, and also because federal policy ultimately shapes local spending. For instance, recall that the extreme militarization of police forces in the US is itself the product of outsized Pentagon funding, and in particular, the war on terror. After 9-11, the Department of Homeland Security started granting municipal police departments funds to purchase military equipment. Theoretically, this equipment was supposed to go toward combating terrorist attacks, but inevitably ended up just being incorporated into everyday policing. To be clear, reallocating Pentagon money alone cannot fully fund a welfare state. We'll also, of course, need a program of heavy taxation on the rich. But there's another reason to target the ever-ballooning defense budget, which is on course to hit $1 trillion over the next few years if it continues to grow at this rate. William Astor, a writer and retired Air Force officer, recently wrote in The Nation, What would it take for the Pentagon budget to shrink? Blowing the whistle on wasteful and underperforming weaponry hasn't been enough. Witnessing murderous and disastrous wars hasn't been enough. To my mind, at this point, only a full-scale collapse of the U.S. economy might truly shrink that budget, and that would be a pyrrhic victory for the American people. In other words, we may be approaching the point where sinking more and more money into the Pentagon doesn't just come at the expense of social services, but also eats into the country's economic growth overall. For instance, the Watson Institute of International and Public Affairs at Brown University found in 2019 that contrary to the myth that war generates more jobs, military spending created far fewer jobs than the same amount of money would have had it been invested in other sectors. They write, if over the years 2001 to 2019, the US had not been at war, but instead had channeled resources into expanding the clean energy industry, broadening healthcare coverage, and increasing educational opportunities, between 1.4 and 3 million more jobs would have been created, reducing unemployment significantly. So that's all to say that divesting money from defense and redirecting it to social provision isn't just a moral and ethical position. It turns out it also has the potential to create jobs, raise GDP, and reduce the national debt, aka the very things that policymakers in both parties perpetually claim to want to bring about. Finally, I would, of course, be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that all of this has already been said many times over. Let's end with this two-decade-old footage of one U.S. legislator that has consistently voted no on increasing the Pentagon budget. The most important point that I want to make is that we have got to get our priorities straight. We cannot continue to cut back on Medicare. We cannot continue to have Medicaid paying, in my state, about one-third of the normal reimbursements that physicians and hospitals get. We cannot continue to have millions of people spending 50, 60 percent of their limited incomes on housing at the same time as we cut back on affordable housing. In this great country, what we have got to do is make sure that all of our people have a decent standard of living, not continuing to cut, cut, and cut on the needs of working families, senior citizens, veterans, low-income people, and then say to the military, hey, we can give you everything you need and, and then some more. So I think uh, for those of us who believe in insane priorities in this country, for those of us who believe that every American is entitled to a decent standard of living, we have got to stand up and oppose this outrageous proposal uh, to increase military spending. Thank you very much. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.